Charter bus was headed to Albuquerque when troopers say it hit a cement barrier in a construction zone along I-40 in Vega. They say the driver, 71-year-old Jerry Bunkner, died at the scene. Three passengers suffered serious injuries. A charter bus wreck in Vega this morning left 18 people injured and the driver dead. He is dead. Several others injured after a bus wreck this morning. The bus was on its way to Albuquerque from a conference in Georgia when around 7 this morning, the DPS says the driver drove into a lane near I-40 and US-385 that had been blocked due to construction. Take a look at the map here. Troopers were called out to this area of I-40 near Vega uh, this morning. It was in a construction zone. Department of Public Safety Sergeant Cindy Barkley says... Out of the 25 people on board, 18 were injured. Three of them were transported to Northwest Texas Hospital in Amarillo with serious injuries. Of those three, one of them had to be airlifted. The driver of the charter bus hit a cement barrier. Five people received minor injuries. Three have life-threatening injuries. One person is dead. Good morning, church. On behalf of Cindy and I and my family, I want to thank you for all the support you've given us during this very tragic time. For those of you that don't know and those of you that do, Ricky was in a very serious chartered bus accident on Tuesday. The bus driver went head on with a huge concrete wall. The driver was killed, unfortunately. Ricky's in critical condition, he's in ICU. He's stable now, he's had surgeries, he had his elbow completely reconstructed and his left arm. His abdominal wall tore, his intestines and stomach fell out. They had to put it back in and redo everything inside. He has a broken pelvic, two broken vertebrae, he's got broken ankle and lacerations throughout his body. The skin on his head was scalped back, peeled back, kind of like you peel a banana. They were able to sew that back together. He's got tubes out of his head where they're draining all the fluid so it doesn't put pressure on the brain. He's improving every day, but he's still in ICU. He'll be there a few more days. They're hoping that maybe in about three days they can remove him out of ICU into a regular room. We have no idea when they'll let him come back to Albuquerque, but I wanna thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your love and support. Cindy and I really wanna thank you. Ashley, her husband, Robert, their children, Danny, Isaiah, little Tony, and Ricky's little girls. Brianna wants to thank you so much for praying for her and her recovery. Thank you for all you've given and all you've shown. We ask that you just continue to stand with us in prayer. God bless you. From the Mansfield family, your pastors, to your heart, we love you. You 
hold my every moment. Morning, church. Again, we are so thankful that you've invited us into your home to worship with you, to praise God with you, to pray together, and to learn more about our amazing and wonderful God. Church, this morning, as we get started, I want to read a scripture from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, and it says this, Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you 
who belong to Jesus Christ. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of evil. Church, that is the command from our God to us. So let us do so together this morning. Again, as we worship, as we praise, as we pray, and as we receive God's word for our life. Let's pray this morning. Father God, we thank you for your instruction and direction for our life. God, let us be joyful, that state of being joyful, worshiping you in all circumstances. And in doing so, God, we see how good you are, that we test everything that is said to your word, that we see what is said is truth. And in doing so, Father God, we are able to combat the evils that are done in this world. It starts with us, it ends with us. So let us be the shining example and testimony of the love, the forgiveness, and the hope that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you, God. Receive our worship and our praise this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Father, we thank you for the way that you love us, for the way that you demonstrate your love, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We can feel your love as we give you the worship and the honor that you're due, Father. Let us sing out your praise this morning as we breathe in your grace and we feel your presence in this place, Jesus.
Father God, Lord, we want to lift up this morning our leaders. Father God, our Senate, our Congress, our president. Father God, our local leaders, our governor, our mayor. Father God, the newest Supreme Court justice nominee. Father, all the proceedings that come along with it. God, we pray that your wisdom is upon our leaders, Father God. Lord, that your peace is upon our people. Lord, the protests, the craziness. Lord, I pray right now that you bring a stop to it through your peace, through your love, through your understanding. Father God, and that we can move together as one people with one heart, crying out to you, humbling ourselves, repenting of our sins, turning away from it. Father God, and accepting your rule over us as being our Lord, our God, and in doing so, our peace, our people will prosper, God. We pray these things in your name. You are supreme. You are the almighty one. And God, I pray that you show your power right now. You give peace to your people knowing you are still in control. You are still God. Lord, let the people of God unite in praying for our fellow men, in praying for those that disagree with us, for praying for those that come against us. God, that they will be seeing the love and the peace of Jesus Christ, and they too will be saved. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities that hold us in bondage. So in the name of Jesus, in the powerful name of Jesus, we pray that your wisdom like a flood, like a hurricane, like a tsunami, literally overtakes our leaders. Their eyes and their ears, their hearts are opened. So they make the right choice for us. God, your love overwhelms us, that we are not given into the spirit of fear, doubt, or hatred, but God of love, of power, and a sound mind. And together, together we move forward to build this great kingdom of God to bring you further glory. God, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, we just want to welcome you once again. Thank you again for letting us into your home. Thank you again for bringing us with you in worshiping and praising our God. Church, before we have Pastor Richard come up and bring an inspired message, I want to let you know of a couple of things. Man, we are that much closer 
to opening our doors. It's going to be amazing, church. We're working tirelessly to get this done. And I will tell you, it will pay off. We will be together once more, worshiping together, welcoming each other, and praising God together. Church, it's going to be amazing. But let me tell you, I want to remind you parents that our youth group is still going on. We're still meeting. We are meeting at a host home. And it's been such, it's, the weather's been beautiful. It's been awesome. We're out in the backyard. We have dinner together. We have worship. We have praise. We study the word together. And at the end of the night, we have a bonfire together just to fellowship. Church, we want you to be a part of this. Parents, we want your kids to be a part of this. They don't have to be isolated anymore. We're welcoming them into our home. So we'd love for you to be a part of that. Please call the church or message us on our various social medias to get the address of our host home. And I wanna let you know, an hour before our service at 5.30, we have a tutoring session, an hour long tutoring session for those kids, for our kids, for our brothers and sisters that are struggling with this online learning. We'd love for them to not only be spiritually founded, but academically successful. Again, that's happening at our host home as well. So we would love for our kids, our students, our young ones to be a part of this. The age group is from sixth grade to 12th grade and young adults, we wanna see you there too because we split off after our time of worship to have our young adults, our, the shift, 18 through 25. We'd love for you to be a part of that as well. So every Wednesday from 5.30 to 6.30, we have our tutoring session for our students. Then from 6.30 to eight, we have dinner, we have service, and then we have that time of fellowship. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Please don't hesitate to call, to message, to text, to whatever you need to do to get a hold of us, to find out that address so that we can all continue to grow in the Lord together. We love you, church. Oh my goodness, church. What a tremendous joy. Thank you for letting us come into your home, into your hospital room, into your rig if you're on in a truck stop i don't know where you're watching but i pray that the holy spirit falls so powerfully where you are that you're going to say i've never felt something like this in our home i've never felt something like this in my vehicle i've never felt something like this in our campground i don't know where you are but i'm telling you where you are god is because we're two or three are gathered he's there with us and i'm so thankful for that as we get into the Word, I just kicked off a sermon series last week, and I'm calling this sermon series Increasing Our Impact. When you and I are literally partnering with God to see how you and I are going to impact a lost and dying world with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of God and the power of His majesty. I don't know if you've ever been up in a situation where everything seems to be against you. That's exactly what I want to talk about today. When everything seems to be against you, when you feel like, oh my goodness gracious, I'm overwhelmed. Everything is coming against me. I am so discouraged. I am so disappointed. It seems like everything I've tried, boom, it fails. One disappointment after another, after another, after another. Well, today I'm looking at a story about a great man named Nehemiah. It's in the Old Testament. We're going to be in chapter 4. We're going to use a few of the scriptures, but we're primarily going to stay in Nehemiah chapter 4. And we're looking at this life. And, and Nehemiah, they had been in the captivity, and they had been in captivity a long time. They had been taken into an area, Babylonia, which today is Iran. So they were in that quadrant of the Middle East. They were close enough to Israel, but yet incredibly far. I don't know if you've ever been close to your Israel, where your place of worship is, where your God is, where the things that you knew that were religious and holy and consecrated to God, and you had known your Christianity and your family had told you about that, and those things, they could remember Israel, they could remember the Holy Land, they could remember Jerusalem, but they weren't there. And they were yet so close, because Iran's not that far away, yet they were really far. Have you ever 
felt that close to God, yet you feel like you're separated. Like there's borders between you. Like you can't get to him and you can't quite get through. And you're saying, goodness gracious, God, I am desperate for you. I'm desperate. I almost feel like you've abandoned me. But yet the word of God says, I will never abandon you. I will never, ever forsake you. Yet you feel disappointed with what's happened in life. And finally, they release them. They release them from their captivity. And Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem only to find the whole city decimated. The walls have been torn down. These aren't like a yard wall, a cinder block wall. Or, uh, we're talking, these things are feet, feet wide, 20, 30, 40 feet wide. And these walls protect the city. They're built to keep the people in and the enemy out. Have you built a wall around your family, a wall where you're saying, God, keep the enemy out. Do not let them penetrate those walls because we have placed a hedge of protection, God's hedge of protection around us. And when he gets there, he sees what's happening and he says, can I go back and rebuild the walls? And he asks that of the king and the king gives him permission. Here, it's his enemy that says, go ahead. And Nehemiah gets there and, and he starts sharing this vision and he's saying, guys, we're going to rebuild this. We're going to rebuild what was, was once ours. And some of them had never even lived in Israel. They had never lived in Jerusalem. They had never even been there. Yet they were there because they knew that's where their roots were. That's where they were. That's why we think and call on the name of the Lord and we pray that scripture over our children in the book of Proverbs where it says to train up a child in the way he should go and even when he's old and if he departs from it, he will come back. Our children will be back. Our, our spouses, our husband, our wife, the, the, the wayward son or daughter, the wayward husband or wife, that, that prodigal will come home. And they finally go home and they start building the wall and Nehemiah shares this enormous message and he's fired up and the people start working hard. And now in chapter four, and look what it says happens in verse six. At last, the wall was completed to half its height. Half its height around the entire city for the people had worked with enthusiasm, with heart. Heavenly Father, I pray that we can see what we could do when we work with all of our heart, but sometimes we come up short and only build half of it. God, help us to know what to do when everything seems to be against us. And Lord, we are disappointed. I pray in Christ's name, amen. Man, they had worked hard. They had built up the wall up to halfway, but they're only halfway done. And they're kind of like, whoo, whoo. <laughs> Man, why does disappointment come? What happens? Sometimes you're in the middle of a project, you're in the middle of an outreach, you're in the middle of, of a ministry, you're in the middle of a family project, you're in the middle of something really, really awesome, and all of a sudden you get halfway through and you kind of like get tuckered out. You're like, ooh, que la, ooh, forget it. <laughs> and you don't even know what to do. What causes disappointment? Well, I'm glad you asked because I want to talk about at least four causes of disappointment. The first one is fatigue causes disappointment. Fatigue, when you just get plain tired, you're exhausted. They had been working and working and they build the wall halfway up. But look what happens in verse 10. We're still in Nehemiah 4, verse 10. Let's just read the first part of verse 10. Then the people of Judah began to complain. Oh, don't we have complainers in the house? Oh, my gosh, you know who you are. They began to complain. The workers are getting tired. Stop right there. The workers are getting tired. Let me tell you, they're complaining. Ooh, they're, they're getting tuckered out. They're, they're, they're disappointed because they've only gotten halfway through and, and, and now we're tired and we, we don't have it done and we're wondering. It's just like our building right now. It's not finished and people are going, when are we going to move in? When are we going to move in? When are we going to move in? And I keep saying, I don't know. 
And the reason I don't know is because it's not finished and we're so close to being finished, but we don't have a certificate of occupancy. They haven't finished inspecting the building. We don't have all the details in place. So until all those details are in place, guess what? We don't know. And people are starting to complain. Ooh, forget it. Ooh, we're tired of waiting. Ooh, we're tired of this. Ooh, we're tired of that. You know what? People get disappointed and fatigue causes part of it. I know you might be tired with something you're going through. You're tired in your marriage. You're tired of your husband's attitude. You're tired of your wife's attitude. They don't care anymore. They don't seem to care. And the marriage is just halfway of what it used to be. And you don't know if it's half full, meaning getting better, or if it's half empty, it's draining. And you're tired. Your children are pushing you to the edge and you're tired. Your job has just been jerking you around and you're tired. Your friends at school have been treating you horrible and bullying you, and you're tired. I'm telling you, fatigue causes disappointment. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 and 18. It says, never forget what the Amalekites did to you. Don't forget what they did as you came from Egypt. They attacked you when you were exhausted and weary. And they struck down those who were straggling behind. They had no fear of God. Isn't that just like the enemy? He comes at you when you're tired. That's why Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. In Matthew, he's saying, come unto me. If you're tired, come unto me. If you're exhausted, come unto me. Come to me so I can give you rest. I can give you strength. I can give you hope. I can give you peace. I can give you what you're lacking. Because fatigue will exhaust you and fatigue will disappoint you. And that's why some of you are so disappointed because you're so exhausted and you haven't taken time to de do anything about it. A second thing that causes disappointment is frustration. Frustration. Not only were they complaining that they were tired, read the next half of, he, of, of Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10. Then the people of Judah began to complain that the workers were getting tired, and there is so much rubble to be moved. There's so much rubble. You see, they had knocked down the walls. And let me tell you something. When you're doing a demolition, when we took over this building, many of you were here. You wrote your name on the wall. You wrote scripture on the wall. And then they came in and they demolished everything. You should have seen piles of rubble of just, oh my goodness gracious. It was exhausting. They took something like 20 huge dumpster bins of just rubble out of here. And it was like never ending. It's like they'd take a pile and there was a new pile. They'd remove more and there there was. Doesn't it seem like that in your household? Doesn't it seem like that in your marriage or your home or your workplace? Where, man, you remove all this garbage and there's more. You're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Husband, wife, son, daughter, father, mother, brother, sister. What's going on? Co-workers, bosses, nephews, nieces, men, aunts, uncles, employers, employees. What's going on? Teachers, students, fellow students. What's going on? You're overwhelmed and you get frustrated and you go, ooh, yapa kev, oh, forget it. We move the pile, move the pile, move the pile, and there's another pile. Oh, my goodness gracious. They were overwhelmed. They were frustrated. Like, will this ever change? Is this ever going to end? Is it ever going to happen? We're moving, moving, moving rubble, and we're building up the wall. It's only halfway built, and we're still so much rubble to move. They were frustrated. Look what it says in the book of Psalm 25, verse 16. Turn to me and have mercy, for I am alone and in deep distress. I am so frustrated. I'm in distress. Please, God, come to me. Please turn to me. Please have mercy on me. Because I'm fatigued and I'm frustrated. And a third thing that causes disappointment is failure. Failure. Have you ever worked really, really hard and worked really, really hard and worked really, really hard and 
Pacatelas. Pacatelas means you fall flat on your face and boom. And you're like, wow, poor kid. Poor dude. Haven't you ever seen somebody fall and you go, oh, you don't laugh. You go, oh, I felt that. They're going and giving all they got and boom, they fall flat on their face. Look what it says in the last part now of, we're still in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10, and the very last part says, we will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. We'll never be able to do it. We're never going to be able to do it. We failed. We did halfway, and we just can't finish this. We, we just, I don't even know why we're trying. Just, you know what? Let's call it a failure. Let's call it a day. Let's just quit. We tried, 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 and you just forget it. What's the use anyway? You ever gotten to that point? Some of you are there right now, aren't you? Some of you are already separated. You're not living together. Some of you are under the same roof, but you're in different bedrooms. Some of you are still in the same bed, but you're on the other side of the bed. And you got to make sure no one crosses. There's an invisible line. Because you know what? You're exhausted and you fail and you said, you know what? There's no use. We're not going to be able to build this wall by ourselves. We're not going to be able to put it back together again. Every time I hear that phrase, put it back together again, I always think of Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. The king's horses and king's men couldn't do it. But guess who could? The king. King Jesus can put your life together again. He could put the situation together again. Yet you're exhausted. You are so exhausted, full of fatigue. You're full of frustration. And you're full of just failure. And you feel like, just forget it. I can't do this. I can't. I can't. I, I, I can't do it. It's, it's beyond me. I, it's, it's overwhelming. We can't finish this project. I, I don't even know why we're trying. We cannot finish this project. We can't go another year in this marriage. We can't go another moment here at this school. We can't go another day at this workplace. We can't go another day with this people that are in our life. We can't go another day. We cannot do it by ourselves. But I'm telling you, quit doing things all by yourself. That's the whole problem. That's the way you're exhausted. And that's the way why you're frustrated. And that's the way why you feel like a failure, because you keep doing things on your own, on your own strength, on your own mind, on your own situation. You don't turn to God. You won't humble yourself and ask someone for help. I don't know what's wrong with us. We're arrogant. We think we could do it on our own, but we can't. And we've got to get with the program. We've got to come to realize that. We cannot do it on our own. We need help, and we won't ask. Why are we like that? It's like, for goodness sakes, ask for help. I'm talking to myself. There's times that I haven't cried out for help because after all, I'm the pastor. I am a super pastor. I'm a super Richard. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's what you think as well, don't you? That's right. And you won't ask for help. And you're f pulling away from God. Your, your spiritual walk is not where it needs to be. Your spiritual life is not where you should have it. Your spiritual walk has, has quit. You're not even crawling. You've quit. You failed. You're exhausted. You're fatigued. You're frustrated. You've failed and you've given up and you can't seem to move forward. And now you're sounding just like the people of Judah, the people of Israel. And you're saying, you know what? We, we, we just can't do it. And we'll never be able to build a wall by ourselves. There's so much rubble. We're tired. We just can't do it. I, I can't do it. You can't do it. We can't do it. I don't even know why we're trying to do it. But you know what? God says we could do it. God says we could do it. 
and he could do it through us and he could do it if we put our trust in him. So when you feel like you're up against it and you really feel like you're up against it all by yourself, I'm here to tell you that there's a way for us to get beyond that and to get through that. And it brings me to the fourth point. The fourth thing that causes disappointment and that's fear. Fear causes disappointment. Fear causes it. And it really does. Look what it says right there in Nehemiah chapter 4. Look at verse 11. And it says, Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, Before they know what's happening, we'll stoop down on them and kill them and end their work. Before they even know what happens. Man, didn't that happen to you? Before you knew it, boom, your marriage is being attacked. Before you know it, boom, your kids are being attacked. Before you know it, boom, you don't even know what's happening. You don't know how it happened. It says before they know what's happening, we'll stoop in and kill them and end their work. That's what the de devil's doing. That's what he's doing. The enemy is coming against you without you even knowing what's happening. He snuck in. He snuck in because of movies you're watching. He snuck in because of movies that you've been bringing into your household. He snuck in because of music you're letting in to your life and into your ears and into your environment. He snuck in because of different language that you just got soft with and before you know it, you're using it too. He snuck in and he got in there while you weren't even looking and fear has caused disappointment because now you were like, ooh, Kela, forget it. We were attacked and we didn't even know and oh my gosh and I, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my marriage. I'm afraid I'm going to lose my kids. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Look what it says in verse 12. We're in Nehemiah 4, verse 12. The Jews who lived near the enemies came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. And these are people that live nearby and they go, they're going to attack us. They're going to attack us. I see what's happening. I see what's happening. They're coming to get us. They're coming to get us. They're going to get us. They're going to get us. Watch out. They're going to get us. Oh, my God. And before you know it, it creates more fear. How many of you know fear is very contagious? Negativity is very contagious. Fatigue is very contagious and it creates disappointment. Frustration is very contagious and it creates disappointment. And all of a sudden... Here you are and you end up failing and failure is contagious and it causes disappointment. And then fear creeps in. And before you know it, you think there's nothing I could do right. There's nothing I could do right. Everything I do, every, we get dramatic. Everything I do, everything I touch, everything has failed. No, it has and calm down. Yeah, oh my gosh, it's penny penny, the sky is falling. My world's coming to an end. I just ought to just crawl up, crawl in a hole and die. And God says, I came to resurrect. I came to give back life. I came to give it an abundance. I came to raise you up. I came to build you up. I came to give you a hand up. I came to lift you up. I came because I am the lifter of your countenance, the lifter of your head. Humble yourself and I will lift you up, saith the Lord. So man, you might be full of fatigue and frustration and failure and fear. But fear not, my brothers and sisters, because God is for us. And if he be for us, nothing could be against us. Hear me. It'll come against you. But God is the victor. He is the conqueror. And you and I are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, who gives us strength. So what's the cure then? What's the cure? What's God's cure for disappointment? What can we do to conquer the disappointments in our life? Well, I'm really glad you asked because first of all, you've got to get adequate rest for your body. You've got to get some rest. You need to really be able to take some time out and rest. I don't know about you, <coughs> but when you have a bad night <coughs> and everything's going wrong, Oh, my goodness gracious. And you're tired. Man, you start getting emotional. You start getting crabby. Before you know it, you're barking at everyone. You're upset. <coughs> you're just kind of grumbling and mumbling and uh, just a, a bear to live with. Next thing you know, everyone's staying away from you. 
You don't even know what's going on. You're all emotional. You're either mad, you're angry, you're short with people, or you're a crying, bumbling mess, and you're just crying all the time and don't know why, why you're even crying, but you're crying, you're crying, you're crying for everything. What's wrong? Did you see that commercial? It was beautiful. Oh my gosh, you're just emotional because you're exhausted and you get a really good night rest. You obey the word of God and you just get up and you're like, oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. Oh, yeah, baby. You can handle anything because you know that God is going to be with you and he's going to strengthen you and he's already taken care of it and he's going to work things out better than you can and even imagine. But you got to get a good night's rest. We got to be able to see that. We got to be able to see. Look, I mean, we need to start obeying the word of God. Look what he says right there in Psalm 119, verse 73. Be good to your servant. He's saying, God, please be good to your servant that I might live and in, obey your word. That I might live, that I might get that rest, that I might get that peace, that I might live that l word live. Zoe, it's literally talking about the abundance of life. Life to its fullest. I want that, Lord. And when I get adequate rest, I have that. Because he renews you. He renews you. Your cup runneth over. Look what he says in Psalm 127, verse 2. He says, it is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. You're there stressed out. You're all worried what's going to happen. And he says, would you calm down? Look at the birds in the air. Look at them. Do you see them stressing out? Look at the lilies in the field. They're gorgeous. They, nobody even waters them. God just takes care of them. These beautiful things. Look, people think that the desert's just all brown. <laughs> Man, they're missing the beauty of it. They don't see the beauty of our desert. They don't see the beauty in Albuquerque and in New Mexico. Yeah, Albuquerque has a lot of brown. We have a lot of dirt. But man, we have the beautiful Sandia Mountains that just look the color of a watermelon. That's why they're called Sandia when that sun sets. And oh, my goodness gracious. They just change colors, the sky. God just uses the sky as his canvas and he paints the beauty, oh, of his character, of his creation. And all we have to do is rest and enjoy it and be fed by it. Look what he says in Isaiah chapter 40. We're gonna look at verse 29 and then jump over to the verse 31. 29 says, he gives power to the weak. So you're fatigued, he gives power. And strength to the powerless. So you're not only fatigued, but frustrated, man, he gives you strength. Verse 31, he says, he gives power to those who are tired and worn out. Jesus is much better than Geritol. <laughs> he gives you power. Geritol was for iron poor blood. This is Jesus who renews your blood. He offers strength to the weak and they will soar high on wings like eagles and they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and they will not faint. Why? Because they have put their trust in the Lord. They've rested in the Lord. And man, they really are getting it together. Not only do you need to really rest your body, but God's cure for disappointment is he wants us to reprioritize our life. You've got to reprioritize your life because let me tell you something, we lose focus. You know what's really interesting? The lion tamers, if you remember when you went to the circus, they always had a stool, a stool that they would hold up and it either had four legs or three legs on it. But the reason when they have three or even four legs and it's right in front of that lion's face, they get confused because they see too many. And that way, that's why they're kind of like, whoa, and they use a whip to boom and they get all freaked out like, oh, this is too much for me to handle. 
handle. Haven't you ever been like that? This is too much for me to handle. Whoa, slow down. I can't take that many things at once. Quit throwing so many things at me. Haven't you ever been there? Haven't you ever felt like that? Haven't you ever lived with somebody or been with somebody or worked with somebody that's overwhelmed and they feel, and, and you say, slow down, calm down. Oh my goodness gracious. Take a deep breath, it's gonna be all right. Now we need to reprioritize. Let's slow, let, let's look over everything. Let's take a look and let's, let's really look at this and let's reprioritize what's going on. Look, that's what Nehemiah did. We're back in Nehemiah chapter four and I wanna jump over now to verse 13. It's the next verse we're looking at. And he says, so I placed armed guards so Nehemiah says, this is what's going on. The people are complaining. The Jews living nearby the enemy are saying they're going to attack us. They're going to come when we're uh, not looking, when we're least expected. They're going to come. And he goes, so you know what I did? He goes, this is what I did. I re reprioritized the situation. Verse 13, so I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. And I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. So I got ready. We're not only standing in the gap, and that's where you get that saying, they're putting people where there was gaps in the wall, well, we're gonna put a whole family there. But they're not just gonna be there a, a target, no, they're gonna be armed and dangerous. You are not going to come and take what the devil wants to take because God has given us this and we are going to stand on God's promise and you got to come through us to get it. And you know what? Greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. So you don't have a chance, devil, because my family, we are together because it's for me and my family, we shall serve the Lord. We have every tool we need, swords, spears, and bows. We're ready. We are ready. And our leader has placed us in the right place because he right, reprioritized. We're going to build a wall. Some are going to build and some are going to be protecting. And some of them are going to be using, the, they're, they're going to be using their troth in one hand and, and their trial in one hand. And they're going to have a spear in the other. You're going to be working and being on guard because we have a plan and we have reprioritized everything. We have it together. Don't you think we don't have it together? And some of you in your marriage right now, you need to reprioritize your marriage and put the important things first. Oh, but I got to coach Little League. Let me tell you, you need to coach your family. You need to coach your husband and your wife and your son and your daughter and your brother and your sister. You got to regroup and reprioritize your family. Some of you are trained to save the whole world while you're going to hell on a handbasket. It's time that you reprioritize your life and say, you know what, we've got to change some things. Look what it says in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Let us not neglect, so we're not supposed to neglect, our meeting together, in other words, our worship service, as some people do. See, some people are already in the habit, I don't go to church anymore, I don't go to church anymore, but encourage one another. So there's a reprioritizing. You know what? Some of people have gotten lazy now because we don't have in-person service and because we don't have an in-person service, ah, you know what, we don't have to, oh, oh, we've seen Brother Richard before anyway. We've seen Pastor before. Oh, here we are, we're just gonna sit. And you know what? You've gotten into this habit now that you're not getting together, but it says encourage one another, especially now that the day of the return is drawing near. So you know what he's saying? He goes, get out of those lazy habits, reprioritize your life. Just because we're not having in-person service, you need to take time to worship God. And when we open up, you need to reprioritize your life and get back into church. And you're saying, oh my gosh, but COVID and you know what? And I'm telling you, we run a very, very clean, sanitized operation around here. And we make sure that people are going to be taken care of. From wearing masks to sanitizing chairs and areas. And you know what? We want to make a safe place for you, for me, and all of us to really celebrate the Lord. And I bring you to the third thing. Not only do we need to get rest, not only do we need to reprioritize our life, but you know what we need to do? Refocus our life back on God. 
Refocus your life back on God. Don't just reprioritize your life. But you know what? Take a really good look and say, am I really even looking towards the Lord? Am I looking to him as my first resource or is he my last last resource? It's like I don't have anything left but him. Well, I, be, I guess we'll turn to God. Well, that's really encouraging. Look what he says right there. We're back in Nehemiah chapter four. Look at the first half of verse 14. Then I looked over the situation. So Nehemiah is checking it out. And I called together the nobles and the rest of the people. He calls them together and he says to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord. He's saying refocus on God. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious. He's saying, what's wrong with us? Guys, we need to regroup here. Okay, we reprioritize. I put you in the right spots now. We're going to be able to defend the people. We're going to be able to put together what we need. I'm going to have swords and we're going to have bows and we're going to have spears and we're going to be able to take care of everybody and we're going to be able to have you armed and you're going to be able to be able to guard yourself and guard your family and guard the city. We're not going to let the enemy penetrate. But let me tell you something. I want... You don't know. I looked around and I need you to remember something. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Instead, focus on the Lord. Put your focus back on the Lord. Refocus your life back on the Lord. Refocus everything. Remember the Lord, he says, for he is great and glorious. So don't forget what he's done. That's why every time you see over and over and over, they remind us of what God has done because he could do it again. What does he say just in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7? He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. He goes, first he starts off by saying, don't worry about anything. It's like that's easier said than done. I hate to say it, but I find myself worrying sometimes and I go, God, I need to give this to you. What's wrong with me? Quit picking it up, Richard. Leave it alone. But I got to refocus. He says, don't worry about anything. In everything. He says, in everything. With prayer. <coughs> prayer and praise. Let your request be made known unto God. And then the peace of God. That surpasses all understanding. Will guard your heart, mind, and soul in Christ Jesus. But he says, remembering what he's done, remembering what he's done. Why do you remember what he's done? Because when you get re-energized by the faith of the past, you will have faith for the future. <coughs> and it's so important that we get re-energized. We refocus our life on the Lord. Look what he says, Psalm 119, verse 25. <coughs> I lie in the dust. Haven't you ever felt like that? <laughs> You're dirt. I lie in the dust. Revive me by your word. I got to refocus on the Lord. I got to refocus on his word. I have to refocus because there's power in the Lord. There's overwhelming joy in the Lord. There's overwhelming goodness in the Lord. And I need to put all of my trust, all of my hope, everything in that. Because once I've done that, that's gravy, baby. That's gravy, man. That's just smooth sailing. And it's wonderful. And it's time that we do that. It's time that we put our trust, that we get the rest we need, that we reprioritize our life, that we refocus our life on the Lord. And we celebrate those things which he's doing. Celebrate those things that he's done. Celebrate the things that lie before us. And it's so important that we do them and so important that we have. And it brings me to the fourth thing that he says to do. And he says, resist the disappointment. Resist it. The Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The devil comes to try to disappoint you and you need to resist that disappointment. Say, I refuse to accept it. I refuse to bow to it. I refuse to react to it. I refuse to get into the craziness that brings, that, that comes about in disappointments. And I'm going to surrender my life over to the Lord and trust him in this moment because I'm not going to allow 
me to get defeated and be beat down because of the disappointment. So I resist you, disappointment. You have no place in my household, in my thinking, and in my marriage, in my children, in my parents, in my workplace, in my business, in the things that I do. You've got to resist the disappointment. Look what it says. We're back in Nehemiah chapter 4. Look at verse 14. Now, it's the second half of verse 14. And he said right there, he said, remember the Lord who is great and glorious. And he says, and fight for your brothers. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives and fight for your homes. He wants you to fight for your family and the things that you own. A lot of times we say, oh, they're just materialistic things. They might be, but when God gives them to you, he gives you materialistic things to use them for his glory. And he's saying, I want you to fight for all of your possessions. And it starts with your household. You fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and, and for your homes and all the things that are yours. Don't let the devil come into your yard and start taking stuff. Don't let him come into your house and start taking stuff. He is a thief. He comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. He steals your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your faithfulness, your gentleness, your self-control. And next thing you know, you're out there making a complete fool of yourself and a fool of your family and a fool of yourself and a fool of the Lord because people see you and they know you're a Christian and they go, wow, what kind of God do you serve? Because holy cow, you have a really dysfunctional, messed up lifestyle and your lifestyle sure doesn't bring glory to God. And they go, man, and you call yourself a Christian? And what they're saying is that, you know what? You've allowed disappointment to come into your life, into your home, into your marriage, into your family, into your children, and into your possessions. And now you're using them for wrong instead of for right, for evil instead of for good. And you have set them apart for God and they're no longer God's. The devil came in and he took over and he's got a run of it and it's made a mess. And you are now going, what on earth did we do? How did we ever get here? What did we do? How did this ever even happen? Man, let me tell you something. When you're up against it, oh my goodness, it's overwhelming, isn't it? It is, it's overwhelming. And look what he says in Galatians chapter six, verse nine. In Galatians chapter six, verse nine, he says right there, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we what? Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up hope. Don't give up strength. Don't give up your place. Don't give up your family. Don't give up your marriage. Don't give up your children. Don't give up. I don't care how fatigued you are, how frustrated you are, how much of a failure you feel like, or how full of fear you are. In the name of Jesus, rise. In the name of Jesus, say, we might have the wall only halfway built, but in the name of Jesus, we're going to finish this. God's going to be with us. He's going to lead us. He's going to guide us. Nothing is going to keep us away from this. Nothing is going to let the devil come back into our home. Man, we've kicked him out because we're going to just stand. We're going to get the rest we need. We're going to start reprioritizing our life. We're going to refocus on God. And we are going to resist the disappointment. And we're going to say, get out of here, devil. You have no place here. And we're going to trust God, just like in the book of James chapter 4. It says... Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Flee the disappointment and resist it and say, get out of here. You're not going to take root here. And some of you have been overwhelmed because everything seems to be against you. And you just got overwhelmed and you got disappointed and you felt like you were all alone and God abandoned you. But I'm telling you, God will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never abandon you. He won't walk away. The only one that's walked away is you. He still talks to you. You've just become deaf. The other day I had headsets on. I had these headphones on. And I was listening to this Bible study. And I was so into this teaching 
that a young man from our church came and I was sitting down here in the new sanctuary. We were going to just do some work in here and I'm sitting there and he had walked in and he had already said hello. I didn't hear. Man, I was so lost into that moment. I didn't hear a thing around me. And all of a sudden I happened to look up and he's standing there and I go, oh my goodness gracious, I am so embarrassed. I'm so sorry. I've got these headsets on and I shut it off and I said, I am sorry, sorry. I did not hear you. And I was so consumed with where I was. I wasn't here. I was here. And that's what Satan's done to some of us. He's taken us out of reality and he's taken us into this other world and we think we're over there when in reality you're right here and it's time that you rise up right where you are and take back what the devil has stolen from you. You go into the enemy's camp and take back what he took from you. And you rise up. Say, God, I've been tired, but I'm rested up now. I have renewed my strength. I have mounted up like a, with wings of an eagle and I'm soaring now. And man, oh man, nothing's going to keep me down. I am soaring with the Lord. I hope and pray that you join me in doing that. I hope and pray that you join me in, in saying that's where I'm at. Man, I feel like everything seems to be against me. But after today, I realize that it's not. And after today, I realize that God has an answer and God has a solution and God wants me to be victorious. So I pray that you pray with me. And I say, I pray that you pray with me because I'm praying right now in the spirit. I'm praying that God's word has penetrated your heart and gotten through your thick head and through your thick mind and through your hard heart. And he turns that heart of stone into a heart of flesh that feels again. And you have feelings and emotions and you surrender your life to Jesus Christ and you quit running and hiding and you say, Heavenly Father, from this day on, I want to live for you. And if you've never ever done that, it's called getting saved. It's called accepting Jesus Christ. It's called surrendering your life over to the Lord. It's called inviting him in to be your savior. And if you've never done that, just say this prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, today I realize that I'm a sinner. I realize that I need a savior because I cannot save myself. So Lord, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. And from this moment on, I accept Jesus Christ as my savior and my Lord. I want him to guide my life, govern my life and direct it so that I can walk the streets of gold someday. When I finally breathe my last breath here, I'll breathe my new one in the presence of God. And I pray this in Christ's name, amen. I'm telling you, if you just did that, this is hallelujah time. This is when you go, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Some of you are crying. Some of you have no emotions. You don't have to. Somebody said one time, if you don't cry, does it mean you didn't get saved? No, everyone's different. Some of you are releasing all that guilt and all that pain. Some of you are just going like, well, I don't feel a whole lot of different right now, but all I know is I prayed that prayer by faith that pastor prayed and I, all I know is I'm saved now. And that's all that God is saying. Now for every one of us, you that just gave your life to the Lord and us that already have him, there's times that we're going to feel like everything's against us. And we're going to feel so disappointed because we're, we're completely exhausted, we're fatigued, we're tired. We're frustrated because things just aren't going right. We, we've failed and you know what? We, we just have fear. We don't think we could get rise up and do it again. But in Jesus name, I pray for my brothers and sisters and I pray that God, all of us would experience Lord, the overwhelming goodness of God and find rest in the Lord as we cast all of our cares upon the Lord and we completely collapse in his arms. He will give us rest. And as we find rest, God, we're going to reprioritize our life. And we're going to reprioritize things because we've gotten a little 
just mixed up and we've gotten a little confused and we're going to put all of our trust and hope back in the Lord. And not only are we going to do that, but Heavenly Father, we are going to completely refocus our life on the Lord. And we're going to resist disappointment and re resist the devil and have victory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Church, I just want to take this moment to reflect on how good our God has been to us. He's been faithful. He's held up his promises. And church, by reading his word, it leads us to action. And in this moment, in this time, I want to give our tithes and offerings together. I know it's all electronically, but it's still giving. It's still being obedient to God's word. He's been so faithful to his church. Never forget his faithfulness. Never forget his goodness, his mercy, his grace to us. And in doing so, we are literally driven to obey. We're literally driven to do this thing. Because how can we not, you know? That, that's tithes and offerings. It's not just the church asking for money. I want to get real here. It's the goodness of God and God saying, I've given you all that, I just need a tenth so I can continue the work through my people, through me and through you, through our pastors, through our teachers, through our ministries. That's why we give. And in doing so, we see God reign supreme in the midst of an epidemic, in the midst of the craziness and the unrest in the streets, in the midst of the shutdowns. God is still grabbing the hearts and minds of our brothers and sisters that have been in captivity and in darkness because of his obedient children like me and you. Take this seriously, church. This isn't a suggestion. We do this out of our love for God and obedience to his word. And I pray that God continues to see our obedience and continues to bless new beginnings to continue the work that he set before us. So if you'd pray with me in this moment, Father God, again, I thank you for the opportunity to obey your word. Lord, I pray that you take our tithes, you take our offerings, you take our obedience, you take our 10% and you use it. You use it, Father God, to bring the people in darkness into the light to shatter the bonds that hold them. Father God, that the name of Jesus will be declared on every street corner here in Albuquerque, that through our ministries, there will be men and women, young men and women, students, kids that are brought up in the ways of you, God, to declare wherever they are that Jesus Christ is Lord. God, I thank you. I thank you that after you've forgiven us, after you've saved us, after you gave us a new identity, Lord, you gave us a purpose, you gave us a call, and that is to do just this, to obey your word, to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, and to see your name glorified and exalted above all else. God, we thank you. Let the people of New Beginnings continue to be faithful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, we are so thankful once again that you've invited us into your homes this morning as we've worshiped and praised our God, as we've gone to him in prayer, and we've just expanded our relationship in his wonderful word. Church, we love you. Continue to look out for our events. Continue to watch all the announcements that are going to be coming out because we are this close to coming back and worshiping God as one people together in one room. It's going to be amazing. But we love you, church. Continue to do the work that Christ has called us to do. Love one another, and we'll see you next week. God bless you.